We are really thrilled to be with you today for this official side event, timely data for the SDGs, featuring the launch of the SDSN data platform for the SDGs. Uh, SDSN is really thrilled to be co-hosting this event with the permanent mission of Finland and with Esri. Uh, those of you who might not be as familiar with Esri, they are the masterminds behind ArcGIS, which is a fabulous tool that has revolutionized the way we're able to uh, look at spatial data. And uh, it's a very exciting day. Before I turn it over to Professor Sachs, I just wanted to mention it's a great day for Finland. When we wrap up in about an hour, uh, their prime minister, Sena Marin, will be speaking at the High Level Political Forum uh, just in advance of their presentation of their voluntary national review at 10 a.m. So we'll throw the links to uh, UN television into the chat if anybody's interested in that. And uh, we hope many of you will be with us throughout the morning to hear about the exciting example of Finland. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Uh, thank you for hosting us and uh, for government of Finland. Thank you for uh, in, in fact, uh, making this uh, event possible and uh, hosting the event. And congratulations on all of Finland's uh, spectacular accomplishments uh, uh, at the top of the world in uh, happiness and at the top of the world, near the top of the world in sustainable development. It's a, you're, it's a wonderful country and wonderful uh, guidance uh, for uh, all of the world. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, uh, achieving the SDGs and one crucial aspect of that, and that uh, is uh, timely data. Uh, in order to achieve the SDGs, we need uh, solid management by government. And uh, that means uh, for each of the 17 SDGs, we need to know where we are, where we're going, uh, how uh, we have gotten to the current situation and what is necessary to uh, accelerate progress. And especially uh, in this tumultuous time of COVID-19, where everything is in massive flux and billions of people around the world are extremely vulnerable, we have to understand uh, the situation on the planet day by day, how the virus is spreading, hunger hotspots, uh, economic threats, environmental crises that are simultaneously impinging where children are or are not in school. We are in the midst of a, a digital revolution. I think we all feel it. We're in the midst because of that of a data revolution as well. Uh, we have uh, in fact, uh, of course, uh, more flow of data than uh, was conceivable even uh, just years ago, we're moving into the 5G world. We are in a remote sensing world. We're in a big data world where data can be aggregated by devices, by the internet of things. Uh, we are in a world of global networking where it's possible to collect, for example, the daily data on uh, confirmed cases of COVID or number of deaths per day from COVID, vital information for managing this pandemic. For all of these reasons, uh, we need uh, a data breakthrough for the sustainable development goals. It has been the case with development objectives over the years that we often lag many, many years behind the real time. Uh, it has been shocking to me uh, in the past that our data on poverty, uh, a key indicator, are often five years out of date. Uh, this is because typical poverty measures depend on uh, household surveys that are carried out perhaps every three or four years at a time when we can use big data, proxy data, satellite data, uh, that can model and measure extreme poverty and dimensions of deprivation, even on a, a daily basis, certainly at frequencies uh, of weeks and months, not many years. For this reason, 
uh, SDSN, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, has teamed up with Esri and with National Geographic and with partners around the world to accelerate dramatically the use of real-time SDG-related data. These data exist. Uh, they are already being curated by organizations around the world, but they're not being used by SDG managers and by governments sufficiently. They're not in one place. Uh, they are not being aggregated and used analytically. Uh, and uh, many areas where we could have real-time data are only now coming into use. Uh, there have been breakthroughs just in recent weeks, for example, in collecting real-time data on CO2 emissions, something very important for climate management. Uh, but we did not have such real-time data before, but networks around the world, uh, of both businesses and academia, are now making it possible to co collect this real-time data. For this reason, we are launching a new platform uh, in these days. It's under construction uh, feverishly in real time, uh, just in the spirit of the data, uh, that aims to provide high frequency, high resolution, geographically specific information on key dimensions of the sustainable development goals. For use of these data by the public, and by governments and by specialists, and for promoting uh, more communities of practice to uh, develop real-time data of relevance. And uh, when the direct uh, data, for example, collected by government or surveys are not available to develop proxies uh, that are uh, real-time indicators, at least uh, of the changes that are underway. If I could uh, share my screen, which I will try to do. Uh, let's see if, uh, if you could uh, enable me to share the screen, Lauren. Um, you should already have that permission, Jeff. It says host disabled attendee screening. Oh, sure. Gosh, that won't work then. Apologies. Let me okay. go ahead. You should have it now. And I know this is going to happen as well to Mr. Oviedo. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, enable that for him too right now but you're gonna share first, Jeff. Okay, so I am sharing, very good. And to do that, uh, now I think it's this one, share. So uh, I would like to very, very briefly introduce uh, the sdgstoday.org uh, website, which is uh, going to be formally launched uh, at an ESRI conference uh, tomorrow, but the uh, purpose of the SDGs Today website is to bring together and to curate real-time data for each of the 17 SDGs. And uh, you're looking at the new homepage and some of the uh, variables uh, for which we have real-time data are indicated uh, in this uh, SDG map that you see. Uh, so starting uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the World Data Lab produces estimates of the population living in extreme poverty. Uh, we have from the World Food Program, uh, the food insecure population estimates that are based on real-time observation of food insecurity. Uh, I think all of us uh, are familiar with the COVID-19 real-time data, which has uh, been perhaps uh, uh, the world's uh, main entry point into real-time SDG-related data in recent months. Uh, we have from UNESCO uh, <coughs> uh, data on number of children out of school, whether schools are open or not, uh, open in particular countries. We have real-time data on world female leaders, uh, as in Finland, where uh, female leadership has proven to be by far the most successful in containing this terrible epidemic. And uh, 
male leaders uh, have uh, proven to be uh, very much uh, behind the curve in uh, containing the epidemic. I think a, a real lesson for uh, um, our global politics. The more women leaders, the better. Uh, and uh, as uh, this real-time uh, scorecard uh, shows uh, 17 percent uh, of uh, world leaders uh, are women. If I click that uh, map, uh, we can see where some of these uh, leaders are in the world, uh, as uh, our global map uh, shows up. But uh, we have, uh, just as an example, day by day, uh, accounts of where women are presidents, prime ministers, uh, and uh, in a uh, different slide, uh, real-time measurements of, uh, of uh, the parliamentary leaders. So uh, women uh, heads of state, women heads of government, women in parliament, uh, and uh, real-time indicators on digital gender divides. Uh, if I uh, walk back to the main page, just to continue very brief, uh, br very, very quickly, uh, I will do that. Uh, we have uh, near real time measurements of populations without access to electricity in Africa. We have IMF estimates of fiscal spending on the COVID uh, epidemic. We have new real time data or near real time data on carbon dioxide emissions for major regions of the world. We have uh, air quality by the hour, uh, of course, I think many of you uh, use those data and uh, that's relevant for SDG 11 uh, shown here. Uh, we have uh, indicators of temperature anomalies, uh, of course, uh, in our era of climate change indicators of deforestation, indicators real time of where there are conflicts and protests. Uh, maybe I can pull up uh, that map just to uh, show you. Uh, again, these are maps that are collated by and curated uh, in this case by the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. And you, uh, we have a world map uh, which is just loading up. Uh, where you can see uh, and click on uh, conflict zones or protest zones uh, in uh, all over the world uh, that is, uh, in this case, uh, measured, uh, uh, I think, on uh, a weekly uh, updated basis. So it's an absolutely remarkable data set relevant to SDG 16. Uh, which is uh, the SDG for peaceful and inclusive societies. Uh, all of this uh, in summary is to say that we are in a new digital age. Uh, we depend on this digital age, uh, obviously in fighting the pandemic uh, and in achieving universal access to health or to education or to government and in being able to manage the sustainable development goals. Real-time data are made possible in this digital age, and we need to, and are in the midst of, therefore, a great data breakthrough. Please join us in this effort. Uh, if you have real-time data or ideas about real-time data, please uh, contact me or contact my colleagues at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, let me uh, conclude by first thanking our partners, uh, ESRI and National Geographic, and all of the partners uh, that are shown here from World Data Lab, World Food Program, Johns Hopkins University, uh, the uh, innovator of the COVID data, uh, the UN agencies, uh, and uh, many, many more partners uh, that are key to this shared effort in real-time data. Uh, let me thank uh, the lead of our data work at UNSDSN, uh, Jessica Espy, uh, and to thank the wonderful project manager of SDGs today, Mariam Rabi, for her great work uh, and uh, 
my and her colleague on this, uh, Ismini Etheridge, who's done a great job on helping to uh, get ready for our launch of this website tomorrow. Thank you for the chance to introduce this. I really hope that this is the beginning of a wonderful partnership together uh, in uh, using big data, digital data, remote sensing data, uh, all, uh, ge uh, geographic information system uh, data, all that we can now do to uh, dramatically improve our capacity to understand, to measure, and to manage the process to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the rest of the discussion. And back to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Jeff. It is my great pleasure following your wonderful demonstration of the panel to introduce the next speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Juka Salovara, the permanent representative of Finland to the United Nations. Uh, thank you so much, and, and thank you, Professor Sachs, for sort of sharing that impressive, impressive data set. Uh, from my own experience in working for, for, for government back home in Finland, I, I know how important data is for policy making. And when you make data avail available and the data is relevant and preferably also sort of well, well presented, it really has an impact on, on policy making. Uh, and the other sort of item I was very glad that you mentioned was also gender equality. I, for one, I'm very happy in working for a female-led government, and and I, I think that sort of <laughs> that that's a reflection on the fact that policy making is is inclusive, and and when policy making is inclusive, then it usually leads to to much uh, better policy. But uh, dear participants, uh, on my behalf, I would like to warmly welcome you all to this virtual HLTF uh, side event. Uh, Finland has been cooperating with the SDSN in several projects that aim at more effective data production and use in the context uh, of the 2030 agenda. Data, as previous speakers have underlined, has key importance for successful implementation of the 2030 agenda we need data to monitor our progress to understand where we are moving forward and where we are lagging behind. The simple truth is, truth is that without data, we are really flying blind. The uh, international community, as well as individual countries, uh, face several challenges in the production and use of data for sustainable development. Data coverage is one of the key challenges. We have a robust set of global indicators for the SDGs, but at uh, country level, uh, the coverage, meaning the number of indicator, indicators on which the data is produced, varies significantly from country to country. Especially developing countries need uh, more support for increasing data coverage. International funding for data and stati statistics is at only around half the level at which it need, needs to be. I can just echo what Professor Sachs just said about the importance of data, its availability, and especially its use. Timeliness is another challenge. Uh, as you know, statistical data often represents the situation as it was one year, or in many cases, two years ago. Uh, political decision makers, on the other hand, strive for real-time data. It is needed for making good decisions and it is needed to show constituencies that decisions are having the desired impacts. I believe that we need two kinds of data, uh, well-verified statistical data, which comes a bit late, and real-time data, which sometimes is a bit less accurate. We need both. The third challenge that deserves to be mentioned is the disaggregation of data. The key principle of the 2030 Agenda leave no one behind is impossible to monitor without disaggreg disaggregated data. Persons and groups in vulnerable situations are often unrecognized as long as we look at averages. We need to disaggregate to make vulnerable groups visible. But with each disaggregation, the amount of data multiplies and this creates a new challenge for the use of data in decision making. I believe that the SDSN data plat platform that has been developed in partnership with ESRI and National Geographic significantly contributes to resolving the challenges of coverage, timeliness, and disaggregation. 
It is a bold, novel, and innovative way to address existing data challenges, and I congratulate all three organizations for their efforts. Um, to finish, just sort of recapping that the Vienna our report for Finland will be re presented today, and thanks, Oloren, for already sharing the link to the first the keynote speech and the actual uh, presentation. We are very proud that our Prime Minister, uh, Sanna Marin, will be presenting it. And as you may know, uh, in Finland, the Prime Minister leads work on sustainable development and has, has done it for over a quarter of a century. In this uh, VNR report, which is our second uh, report, we describe Finland's situation on each SDG by using SDG indicators. We also present two assessments of our situation on each SDG. One assessment, assessment is made by government officials, and the other assessment is made by civil society. I invite you all to take a look at this report, which in our view creates an interesting database dialogue between the government and civil society. We are committed to continuing working on improving database monitoring on the SDGs so that we can scale up implementation of the SDGs based on the best available information. So thank you so much, and I'm really glad that we are having this side event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, I completely agree. Your point was an excellent one, that without data, we are flying blind. And hopefully, this new portal and platform is a, a way to help close some of those coverage gaps that you also mentioned. And uh, congratulations again to Finland for the, the VNR. We're looking forward to that today. It's my pleasure to turn it over now to Juan Daniel Oviedo, who's the director of the Administrative Department of National Statistics for Colombia. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, let me confess that I am very proud to be here sharing this scenario with Professor Sachs. Uh, somebody that from my academic background I admire very much and, I, and I'm very excited to be here to listen to uh, his insights and also the insights that were highlighted by Mr. Ambassador. Um, in Colombia, we are completely convinced about the strategic role that information has been performing uh, as regards as the accomplishment of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we would like to highlight that currently in the pandemic situation, we have valued very much the existence of these Sustainable Development Goals because the, the opportunity of concentrating around 17 objectives and 169 indicators is also an opportunity to target and to prioritize which are going to be the main policies that we have to develop in order to come back to the sustainability world, let's say, in our socioeconomic development model in our country of Colombia. And we believe that in that perspective, national statistics offices play an important role because uh, currently we, we are conscious that we are not only providers of information, but we should become data stewards and to illustrate and orientate which kind of information is going to be useful in order to define a sound public policies that could allow our countries to accomplish the uh, 2030 agenda. In the case of Colombia, uh, we believe that the opportunity of uh, putting information at the center of the socioeconomic and environmental development model of Colombia is something which is very useful uh, that, could be, uh, that could be shown as an opportunity to integrate several uh, perspectives about development. So in order to have an interdisciplinary approach of which is the type of information that we require. And moreover, in order to see 
how are we going to set a strategic partnerships in order to allow geospatial information, mobile information, high resolution satellite information to be available in order to put them at the same place and to better communicate which are the uh, socioeconomic perspectives of the population. So I would like to share a few slides that we have prepared uh, for this conversation. Uh, mainly in Colombia, we understand very much that uh, timely data uh, should be produced and disseminated in order to allow the dimensions of sustainable development the social dimension, the economic dimension, and the environmental dimension to be uh, able to be integrated in order to uh, leave no one behind. And the main challenges that we are facing there is that uh, metadata is an issue that is almost solved due to the work of the EAEG of Sustainable Development Goals that we need to and find important ways to effectively disseminate the information that we are producing from the integration between uh, statistical information and geospatial information. And there, in that perspective, uh, we are following, in the case of Colombia, we are following uh, the model of uh, or the standards that has, have been set in the last years in order to allow the integration of the statistical and geospatial information under which uh, we uh, believe and we are convinced that accessible and usable data should be produced, that there should be a statistical and geospatial interoperability of information, and that we need to define common geographies for dissemination of uh, statistics. And one example, which is very important in the current situation of Colombia, of this integration of statistical and geospatial information is linked to the fact that taking the opportunity that Colombia has recently performed a population and housing census, more specifically in 2018, thanks to the fact that the information of the population census have been completely geo-referentiated and geolocated, we were able to integrate the information of the population census with administrative records, both civil registration and health and individualized uh, treatment of uh, public health of every citizen of our country or every citizen of our country. And at the same time, we managed to integrate information of the population census with a household surveys and living standards measurement surveys. And thanks to the fact that we were able to integrate this information, we managed to develop a, in a very fast way a vulnerability index under which we get the population conscious about the risks or the complications that they could face in the case that they could get infected by COVID-19. And we allowed this information to be available to every citizen in our country at a street block level, which is something that we are going to show you in a few minutes. But at the same time, something which is very specific is that this information was very useful in order to define some non-conditional uh, monetary transfers program in order to face the income shock of the households due to the lockdown measures, and also to define how we were going to uh, provide poor and vulnerable households uh, with a value-added tax reform, and also in order to define cash and in-kind aids given by mayors and governor's offices in our country, thanks to the opportunity of having this information available at the street block level. And that's why currently I'm going to share my Google, uh, my website is, is screen 
under which when we go to the main uh, web page of the National Statistics Office of Colombia, DANE, we easily go to the main screen, which is the vulnerability index that uh, drives us to uh, 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 this geospatial and statistical information that we could see at, this, uh, uh, at every urban area of Colombia, we could uh, analyze it uh, in this geospatial information frame. For example, this is the city of Bogota that currently, since yesterday, is uh, under localized or targeted lockdowns due to the fact that we are getting closer to the peak of the pandemic situation of COVID-19 in our country. We managed to see Bogota at the street block level in the intensity or the distribution at the street block level of the multidimensional poverty index of every household thanks to the fact that the uh, population census and housing census allowed us to get this information. And in a, in a, in a raw perspective, you see that in a more intensive, I'm sorry, in a, in a in a in a broader perspective of Bogota, you can see that the southeast of Bogota is concentrates a very important population which is under multidimensional poverty. And we could see at a very specific level, at the street block level, which is the intensity of this multidimensional poverty index. Thanks to the fact that the multidimensional poverty index measures, for example, overcrowding, the existence of elderly population at the households. And at the same time, thanks to the fact that the information of the population census has been completely identified with the DNI of every citizen, we could cross the information that we grasped in the population census with the health records and to define the comorbidities of the people which is living at every street block level. And thanks to that, we could go from the dimension of multidimensional poverty to the COVID vulnerability dimension at a street block level, under which we can see, for example, which are the main vulnerabilities of the population uh, due to the fact of the existence of intergenerational households, overcrowding situations, and the uh, comorbidities uh, associated with, a, for example, a heart uh, issues, for example, hypertension, on, for example, a smoking a, a indicators of the population. So in this, in this perspective, we could see Bogota uh, in, at the dimension of the vulnerability index, but at the same time, thanks to the fact that we, got, uh, that we grasped this information, we could also see in Bogota, which is the distribution of the elderly population, more specifically of the population, which is elder than 70 years old population. And we could see which are the main uh, street blocks or the main uh, neighborhoods of Bogota that are characterized by the incidence of elder population, something that you can see at the northeast of, of the city, for example. But the more important issue is that in order to have timely information about the success of the lockdown measures, Thanks to the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and the opportunity to work together with the initiative Grand Data, we managed to get mobility information that could allow us to see what was happening with the vulnerability level of Bogota and uh, the uh, accomplishment of the lockdown measures in the city. And that's why, for example, I would like to show you that uh, we could see 
that currently Bogota, this is the, this is the map of Bogota, currently Bogota is under a strict, a strict lockdown measures in the green areas. One of the green areas that you see like San Cristobal or Usme is this San Cristobal and Usme that you are seeing in, in this map. And we can see, thanks to the information of grant data, which is the accomplishment of the main measures of the lockdown measures with mobility, thanks to the fact that grant data allowed us to get information about a mobility of mobile telephone, te telephone users at a, day, at a daily frequency since the beginning of the lockdown, which was by the end of March. And you can see why the mayor of Bogota had to start the lockdown measures in this region of the city, because you can see that even under the days that we were under a strict lockdown in all the city, the fact that this part of the city is subject to a strong and multidimensional poverty, informality, socioeconomic vulnerabilities, it was very hard for the population to accomplish the rules of staying at home and not finding something to eat. And that's why currently one of the pandemic and concentration points in the city of Bogota is in this region. And that's why currently we are uh, under a, a strict lockdown measure in this part of the city. This one, this was a, a very simple example of showing how the National Statistics Office uh, is considering that the linkage of geospatial information and statistical information is vital for sustainable development goal, but is also vital to allow our statistical offices to become data stewards and allow policymakers to take smart decisions at a timely, at a timely basis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Juan Daniel. That was a very exciting platform to see beautiful visualizations. Um, and again, I really applaud Colombia for making so much data publicly available, uh, which is another thing that we're seeing lots of interest about in the chat, lots of people calling for better uh, transparency and access to data. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Carmel Terbero. And Carmel, I'm going to pull up your slides right now. Thank and we should be all set. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sachs, Ambassador Salavara, and distinguished guests, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some observations and insights that I've noted over the last 27 years working to support geographic information systems, or GIS, enabled solutions for sustainable development. I first walked the halls at the Palais des Nations in Geneva in 1993 while working at UNITAR and GIS was just becoming a technology adopted by UN agencies and member states. In 2000, I was so inspired by the good intentions of the MDGs and the advancements in geospatial technology over the last two decades since have been remarkable. As I'm not getting any younger, we really need to see progress with the SDGs by 2030. <laughs> not a day goes by that I do not think about the lives, livelihoods and the health of our planet, which rely on our actions today and will also be impacted by our inactions today. I will share with you three current issues that our global, globe is grap grappling with and how timely, accessible, and open data is so critical to finding the solutions needed to overcome these challenges and to achieve the SDGs. So consider, next slide. So consider SDGs three and six in the context of the WHO recommendation of hand washing to stop the spread of COVID. Access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, known as WASH, uh, um, is an SDG 6, which is Clean Water and Sanitation Data Indicator, that will lead to good health and well-being, which is SDG 3. SDG Data Indicator 6.2, in particular, helps us to identify uh, WASH infrastructure that needs to be immediately addressed in order to stop the spread of the pandemic. As UN Habitat notes, Access to affordable or free water and soap is a minimum government obligation during this crisis. Add data on vulnerable populations, 
which UNFPA recently stood up in their COVID-19 population vulnerability application, and you can determine who might have difficulties accessing hand washing facilities due to disability, or where the priority development interventions need to be made to implement wash infrastructure. Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 6 are clearly inter interconnected and need timely data to address them. Next slide. SDGs 5 and 10 are clearly, are, are, sorry, are creating about creating balance and opportunity. Let's all commit to doing better in promoting women and those facing discrimination for any reason. We need to do more than simply celebrate diversity. As a geographer, I can assure you that no one has control over where they popped up on this planet. So it is time to turn our good fortune into opportunities for and empowerment of others. We need to mentor youth, be inclusive in every meeting, and let's share the data that reveals opportunities to celebrate equality and progress, such as SDG 5.5 that shows even greater than 50% of the parliamentarians are women in their member states of Bolivia, Spain, Granada, and Rwanda. It's quite remarkable. Sustainable development goals five and ten are clearly interconnected and need spatially referenced statistics like that presented by Don, uh, the folks at Dane and that population and housing census data in order to address them. Next slide. Lastly, another issue facing our globe today is the possible hunger crisis as desert locusts destroy crops and the livelihoods of millions. With 20.2 million people facing severe acute food insecurity in East Africa alone, we need to monitor in real time some of the key SDG2 data indicators, such as food price anomalies and prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity. If the current situation does not improve, FAO notes that desert locusts can pose a threat to the livelihoods of 10% of the world's population as they are predicted to spread towards India and Pakistan. How do we use the data that we have today to predict and monitor extreme weather events, such as the cyclones in 2018 that enabled the breeding of the locusts in the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa? And how do we ensure that the outputs of that analysis will be understood by decision makers at the highest levels of government? Sustainable Development Goals 2 and 13 are clearly interconnected and we need timely data to address them. I want to conclude with two points. Open data needs to be more than a policy. It needs to be a practice. Please use the technologies like Esri's ArcGIS Hub that exist to provide data in a variety of formats. And two, annual reporting of SDG indicators, as mentioned earlier, does not enable timely data-driven decision-making. We need to pivot to making data available at the velocity demanded by our rapidly changing world. You will notice that I've not discuss geography and GIS extensively with these examples, but in fact, all of the applications by UN Habitat Iraq, the WK Kellogg Foundation, UNFPA, and certainly SDSN that are, are highlighted are indeed powered by GIS. Many of the SDG data indicators are spatial and temporal in nature, and to integrate data spatially and temporally will help us to understand how these issues are interconnected and to create more holistic and durable solutions to our global challenges. In conclusion, I'm excited by the SDGs Today Global Hub, and I applaud the data contributors who are enabling greater understanding and decision-making on many topics of global and regional importance. The GIS training resources being developed for the hub will also educate the next generation of geospatially literate thinkers. Just as we need to build out the WASH infrastructure, we also need to build out the geospatial infrastructure and collaborate. The future looks bright if we can stay focused on the goals, share the data, and build holistic development solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Carmel. And I think it's uh, really inspiring to see how uh, GIS tools can especially be used to look at some of these interlinkages and um, interdependencies between different SDGs, um, which is something that I think maybe some traditional statistical methods don't always capture. We have just a couple minutes to go to some questions. So I'm gonna suggest that I maybe pose one question to each of our three panelists before I turn it over back to uh, Professor Sachs for some closing remarks. 
uh, I'm going to do the questions and then we'll take the answers in the order in which I'm asking. I'm going to start with uh, Juan Daniel Oviedo. We have a lot of questions asking how the data portal that you've developed for Bogota is used in policymaking and how well versed your uh, policymakers and people who are implementing projects are in understanding, analyzing, and interpreting the data and different ways that you're sort of putting that into practice on the ground. Um, for Carmel, we have lots of questions around um, why GIS skills are important and um, different tools and resources for building up GIS skills. So maybe we can have a quick response from you on what Esri is doing um, for sort of that capacity building around GIS skills um, and any linkages to the new platform that can help that. And uh, for the Honorable Ambassador, uh, we're getting questions about um, are there any efforts uh, from countries to make the data in voluntary national reviews publicly accessible? Uh, people are saying that a lot of them contain really valuable data and not always is it sort of an official SDG indicator that is publicly reported. So um, I know you probably can't speak to every country, but given that Finland is doing their VNR uh, as we speak momentarily, um, maybe you could comment on that about different efforts you have made to uh, make that data publicly available. So uh, brief responses, uh, again, we'll start with Juan Daniel. Okay, thank you. And uh, we, we, we understand that the, the fact that we are able to, to have this uh, uh, integration of information is a, a very important opportunity that could invite uh, uh, other countries and more specifically uh, developing countries and middle income countries in order to think seriously about the responsibility of integrating the information of population census with household surveys and administrative records. This is something which uh, stands at the uh, principle uh, to, in order to orientate or illustrate public policy. Currently, uh, taking into account that uh, we managed to perform the calculation of the multidimensional poverty index at a street block level for every municipality, which are 1,102 municipalities in Colombia. Uh, this was something that uh, played an important role in the design of the local or subnational development plans. In Colombia, the political cycle at the subnational level started at the beginning of uh, this year, in 2020, and that was a great coincidence because we had the opportunity to offer to every mayor and to every governor that had been elected for this four years period, the information of the multidimensional poverty index. And firstly, in the pandemic situation, they asked us the information and they consulted the information and these uh, geovisors that we were open and that we put uh, in, into availability of every city in, in our country, because with the intensity of the multidimensional poverty index at the street block level, firstly, they could perform a very targeted in-kind aids, for example, humanitarian um, groceries and a essential health, um, a health instruments that could be useful in order to prevent uh, the contagion of the COVID-19. So what we believe is that a multidimensional poverty index could be a strategic tool in order to uh, orientate a very sound uh, public policies that could allow our population to advance in the 2030 agenda. But this requires the integration between geospatial information, uh, population censuses, and household surveys 
with administrative records, which stands at the main priority of national statistics offices currently at the United Nations Statistical Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Carmel. Thank you. Um, so why are GIS skills important? Um, GIS uh, is, of course, geographic information systems. And as geography is the um, most integrative science that I can think of, where we're bringing everything together for managing a given place or understanding a given place, it is really important to have people be able to integrate spatial and non-spatial data, pull it together, and understand the um, implications of what is happening both socially, environmentally, as well as economically in a given location. Through this platform, through SDGs Today, there'll be a number of resources developed. Um, you can also find uh, today some resources that we have focused on the SDGs, uh, such as developing SDG 3.3.3 .3 around malaria incidents at the learn.arcgis.com website, and I'll put that in the, in the link in a moment. Um, so we have a number of, of learning resources that are free and available to anyone. We also have a number of MOOCs if you'd like to take it a step further and really get into analytics and map making. Um, so there's a number of resources both on the Learn Lessons and the MOOCs of Esri. Um, as we build out the SDG specific um, resources through the SDGs Today um, platform, there'll be more and more um, specific uh, information on how to develop indicators um, and, and integrate GIS um, and spatial thinking into finding our solutions for the SDGs. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, SDSN, we are huge fans of MOOCs. So I hope a lot of the people on the line check those out. And uh, back to the ambassador for our uh, final question on making uh, voluntary national review data more public. Uh, thank you so much, and I, I may not be the best, best expert on the uh, issue in a way that I can't provide you a global answer, but I can tell that, uh, in, uh, for instance, in Finland, the data is sort of publicly and easily available. And um, I remember a debate uh, we had sort of some uh, 10, 15 years ago when I was working the Prime Minister's office on, on sort of our digital development, and, and the fact was then in a way that sort of all different administrations had, had a huge data sets, but they were usually sort of behind a sort of pay barrier because uh, different administrations were encouraged to sort of uh, find the different income streams. But then it was decided in a way that it makes sense to make this sort of well information well widely available and for free to encourage its sort of application and free use. So I can only say that for Finland, and but I just and but I can say that this is a a good model, and and I would encourage others to adopt it as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, and hopefully Finland can be an example to, uh, as you say, all the other countries that haven't yet made such strides in making their data public. Um, it's a pleasure so much. Thank you, our three panelists, and I will turn it back to Professor Sachs for some closing remarks and final thoughts before we sign off. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's clear that Finland is a role model for the world. Uh, uh, it has uh, continued year after year to be number one in world happiness, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, a very uh, crucial uh, point of, uh, of inspiration and leadership for us. Uh, and uh, no doubt uh, having uh, uh, such a uh, uh, fantastic uh, prime minister, uh, young woman leader, Prime Minister Marin uh, is part of that well-being. And I also want to congratulate Finland for containing the pandemic. Uh, Finland's uh, performance in COVID-19 has been extraordinary and exemplary. And I was just uh, looking at the website uh, this moment. Finland has kept the uh, effective reproduction rate of the epidemic, another real-time indicator of whether the epidemic is being contained or whether it's spreading. It's kept the effective reproduction rate less than one, meaning that the epidemic has been suppressed since April 20th. Uh, this is why there are few cases and why Finland uh, has been able to surmount this uh, in a way that sadly the United States uh, and many other countries have not to date. Uh, another uh, woman leader that I would like to shout out uh, is uh, the mayor of Bogota. Uh, 
uh, uh, Claudia Lopez uh, Hernandez, another fantastic uh, mayor uh, and woman leader in the world and uh, clearly uh, a driving force also in uh, the fantastic work that we heard from uh, Juan Daniel uh, Oviedo. That is uh, so, uh, uh, so remarkable and useful, the tools that you've made. And I think everyone watching, and there are a lot of people watching, I uh, will say, oh, we have to uh, follow along in that. But congratulations to you on those innovations. I think it's all, always uh, important to, to remember as well that it is Colombia that gave us the sustainable development goals idea. It was back in 2012 that the government of Colombia uh, said to the world, we need sustainable development goals. So I thank Colombia for that breakthrough always. Uh, this is a, a, really a fantastic gift for the whole world. And uh, Carmel uh, and Esri, I want to thank uh, you for this fantastic inspiration and partnership, and also your point about needing to understand GIS uh, as a basic tool for understanding our world today. We are going to be doing everything we can at UN SDSN to promote the learning of GIS tools. Uh, your uh, great innovator, uh, uh, Jack uh, Dangervon, uh, who uh, invented GIS uh, in its modern form, um, has given uh, such a powerful tool for the world. Uh, and when I was uh, in school, we didn't have it yet. We didn't know. Uh, and so uh, my generation uh, of economists thought that countries are arrayed in alphabetical order. Uh, we didn't know that they were arrayed spatially. So we didn't have uh, geographic insights. We looked at tables, uh, but we did not look at maps. And uh, we are absolutely in need of uh, looking at maps to understand the interconnections of our world. One of the ways to look at maps is through stories. And uh, one of Esri's innovations is story maps, which is a way to talk about geographic information. Esri and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network will be hosting a competition uh, for schools, for students to make story maps. Uh, this will be launched in August of this year. Watch the website SDGs Today to learn about the competition. And we're expecting some fantastic presentations and story maps uh, produced by students around the world using uh, our uh, GIS and uh, other space, geospatial tools. So that's something very, very exciting. I want to thank, uh, in closing, also the UN uh, uh, Statistics uh, Division and its uh, fantastic director, Stefan uh, Schweinfest for all the leadership of the UN on the side of data, remote sensing, GIS, working with the UN Statistical Commission and the national statistical agencies. This is fantastic work to ensure that the whole world is uh, adopting, developing, and advancing new tools of uh, data. And the UN Statistics Division is a fantastic partner in this. Our work is not a formal UN uh, work and not formal UN data, but it is in partnership and complementary to the great work of uh, the UN Statistics Division. In closing, uh, let me uh, thank uh, all of the viewers. We have a decade to uh, make the SDGs uh, real. Time is short. The current crisis is intense. Last week, we uh, released the SDG index report showing uh, how COVID uh, is a huge threat to all of us, obviously, and to the SDGs. Uh, the data portal, SDGs Today, includes all of the information of the SDG index, so you can bring yourself up to date on the index as well. But please join us in this effort to accelerate progress to the SDGs through the use of new uh, and uh, real-time data. Uh, please uh, give us suggestions for the new SD, uh, sdgstoday.org uh, uh, website. Uh, it is uh, 
definitely uh, just uh, in its early phase. It needs global partnership. Uh, we really look to all of you for advice, suggestions, and contributions uh, to this new shared tool for all of us. Uh, in closing, uh, let me thank all of you for participating. Thank uh, again, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Solovara for uh, hosting us today. Uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, continued efforts together uh, in, in uh, this great uh, challenge and opportunity for the world. And Lauren, uh, back to you to uh, close. Thanks so much. I think that's it. Thank you one more time to all of our wonderful panelists. And we look forward to working with everyone in the decade of action and hope everybody checks out the portal. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.